Welcome back to Big Water Podcast. I am Ross Roberts, and we're going to talk about fishing because that's kind of what I do. But we're also going to talk about a lot of craziness because you also know I like to kind of venture off and you can't really rope me in. And we've got an interesting guy today. We've got a community leader from Sims Fishing. I don't even know what exactly that means, but we're going to find out. Patterson Leith. Patterson, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. You are, you're an interesting character. You're a, you're a guy from the South, right? You work, Correct. live in the North. You work for a company in the West. You're kind of like a compass. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's been a weird, uh, it's been a weird little story getting to where I'm at, but, uh, yeah, I grew up on the Missouri Arkansas border, uh, fishing small little rivers down there for smallies and, uh, poked around on table rock quite a bit growing up as a kid. And uh, then ended up moving to, well, a bunch of places, but uh, most recently Minnesota. And um, yeah, I got a, a, most recently before Sims was at uh, FLW running all the marketing there. I was a VP of marketing for uh, four years. And uh, yeah, now I'm the community leader, community manager here at uh, Sims Fishing Products. But yeah, they're based in Montana and I'm in Minnesota and somehow it works out. So <laughs> well, I'm not just, complaining. It's just like now we're sitting here, we're Skyping or FaceTime and doing all that. I mean, that the, these same things that allow us to be in the same place per se also probably allow you to not have to live in Bozeman, Montana. Yeah. I mean, the benefit actually is, uh, is that I'm not in Montana, right? Like, uh, there's a lot of fishing that happens in the Midwest, obviously. And, uh, it's nice to have an employee that's dropped here in the center of, uh, of what I would consider one of the, the biggest fishing communities um, in the United States, for sure. So we have a guy out, out west in Montana that handles all the fly business, and uh, my job is to kind of handle the uh, what we consider the conventional side of the business. And, you know, I mean, Sims is kind of a unique uh, – I mean, correct me when I'm wrong here. Basically, Sims, originally, he was, he was a guide, right? And he started a clothing yeah. brand. Yeah, John Sims, uh, super rad dude. He uh, – um, started a bunch of different companies, um, and Sims was one of them. There was kind of a lack of high-end quality waders on the market, and he decided that he wanted to manufacture his own. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a, he's this uh, artist that lives in Jackson Hole, Wyoming now. Does these crazy sculptures that are all over the West. Um, really cool stuff. I was a studio art major myself, oddly enough, and uh, was a sculpture guy. So um, kind of a cool roundabout connection with, uh, with him, but yeah, super, super rad guy. And the, you know, company has been around for 40 years and waiters are still manufactured there in Bozeman. Um, so nice to have uh, a, a tie to the American manufacturing story there. And, uh, yeah, just 40 years of quality high end outerwear. And, you know, I'm recently new working with the brand Sims, but I'm definitely not new to the clothing. I mean, I've had their shoes. I mean, just about anything you can imagine I've worn through the years. I think the thing that's kind of cool with Sims that I'm seeing now is, is I don't want to say like, I know I'm going to piss some people off when I say this, but it's kind of like in the early days, you know, especially a lot of those fly guys, it's a little bit of a bourbon and uh, cigar crowd, you know, some of the clothes, but now the stuff's kind of getting hipper. I mean, or, or at least there's, there's a wider array of things that you can wear. I mean, like the shirts I've got on, I mean, you can wear it out to dinner. You can wear it as from a technical standpoint, um, whether you're in a hundred degree heat, those solar flex shirts are pretty badass. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, we cut our teeth for sure in the fly business and, um, you know, uh, have always wanted to try and skew as young as possible. And I think we're starting to get there. I think our clothes are, uh, you know, if you're talking soft goods and stuff like that, they're definitely trending more towards the younger, uh, demo, um, and yeah, I think our outerwear and technical sun apparel, um, and, uh, you know, is, is top of the line. And from a design perspective is in, you know, I'm partial obviously, but I think it's the, the best looking stuff on the market for sure. Yeah. I mean, even I just got back from a snowmobile and trip and the, the new bags, dude, I mean, it's hard to get excited about bags, but when you do what I do for a living, you better get excited. Cause I've been to trips where all of a sudden you get some bad stuff that happens and you, you'll do you'll bags. Become, yeah, you'll be a bag fan when you start doing what I do and hauling stuff around yeah. back of the truck. Yeah, people don't realize actually how important bags are. A good bag can make or break a trip for sure. I've, I've been on some pretty gnarly stuff where uh, 
uh, bags are floating in the bottom of boats and I'm, and I'm happy that all my stuff, <laughs> all my stuff is in there in a waterproof container. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, we got you covered from, from top to bottom for sure. From, from, you know, socks to, to, uh, waterproof submersible bags and, and the clothes to get you from point A to point B and everything in between for sure. And, you know, I guess, you know, kind of backing up a little bit, like Sims is an iconic brand. I mean, people know about it. Maybe you wear it, you don't, whatever. But as you just go to like iCast every year, like I sure you're, you do as, as I have for the last 20 years, it just seems like clothing companies are just coming out of the woodwork. And whether it's because they're going consumer direct or somebody has a website or sell them out of the basement. And it's just, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because I think it allows everybody to keep their, you know, not rest on their laurels, as they say, and keep up on their game. But I mean, you're seeing the same thing, right? I mean, just clothing companies everywhere. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been an influx over the last, I would say, um, five to ten years of, of brands. Um, and I would also say that from a marketing perspective, their focuses have shifted more towards uh, places where where we are more inclined to run into them, right? So, like, you got a company like AFCO who's cut their teeth on the – kind of the coastal fisheries, you know, they've been making gaffes and gloves forever, uh, spending a bunch of money trying to get in the bass market. Same with hook. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a handful of other companies that have, that have popped up. And I think part of it is that it's become really easy to manufacture some of the lower end stuff like t-shirts and hats, right? Like you know, if you if you go back 15 years and you wanted a custom hat, it was kind of a pain in the ass to get one made. Um, you can have one dropped off at your doorstep in uh, in two days now. And um, I think the the ease of that accessibility to products like that, um, you know, and and that's when you start to get into what really makes the products different is is where those blanks are coming from, where where materials are getting sourced. Um, you know, we have a whole uh, piece of our business that is uh, that is dedicated simply to sourcing. Um, you know, it's a it's a big machine. There's there's a um, couple hundred employees at Sims, and and um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's lots of companies that come and go. It's just like bait companies, right? Some of them stick around for a while, and then they're a pain in your ass. So, um, but. But uh, we just kind of keep our heads down and we keep making what we consider the best products in the game. And, and uh, you know, we don't uh, we don't really concern ourselves with what the, uh, the what the competition is doing, because we tend to find that uh, we are the industry leaders in pretty much everything we do. Yeah. And I think you're right when you said like the ease of things, because, you know, as a writer, I go to the ICAST new product showcase and you see all this stuff. And the, these literally like Kmart racks that the guys have there with generally t-shirts and stuff and somebody's got a different logo or they've got a different colored fish or they got some artist guy that made some cool looking thing but it's it's still a t-shirt or it's still just it's not a technical apparel it's not cut you put a guy like me kind of you put it on you're like man this thing doesn't fit worth a shit but the reality is is when fishing the difference is the technical stuff i mean we joke about the bags but the same thing like the pro dry i mean you go do what i do for a living i hear people all the time they're like man, you know, what kind of rain gear or this or that, or, or guys show up with none, you know, and I'm like, man, I'd live in my rain gear. I mean, rather it's, rather, I tell me, it's, it's funny, but I, I think you can probably relate, like, you know, guide clients. I've run, like, 4,000 guide trips on the Great Lakes over the years, and literally I could probably say 399% of that is people show up underdressed, you know what oh. I mean? And I'm like, guys, it doesn't have to be raining to have rain gear on. Um, sometimes it's a wind block. Sometimes it's this, and you, sometimes you need it for five minutes, but it keeps you from getting soaked. And you find out real quick um, the tag versus reality of what's the quality of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I'm, I feel spoiled saying this, but uh, you know, a pro dry is like my dop kit. It doesn't ever really leave my suitcase just because I've gotten so used to having it, and then all of a sudden some weird scenario pops up where it's like, Hey man, you want to go run and, and do something real quick? And it's like, yeah. And I, I don't want to not be prepared. I mean, I've been in scenarios and, and I'm not being dramatic. And as someone like yourself, uh, who spends a lot of time on big water, uh, I, I've had scenarios where, uh, a rain suit has literally probably saved my life. Um, and I don't think that anglers tend to, uh, take layering and clothing and uh, elemental considerations in, into 
enough uh, of their mindset when they go out on a day on the water. And I'm always baffled when someone, uh, when a guy tells, sends me a photo of uh, a dude in the front of their boat who's like wearing jeans and a sweatshirt and a downpour. <laughs> the, the two things. And granted, I get it, like, there's, a, there's a there's a cost barrier, and I'm not saying that everyone needs a thousand dollar rain suit, but if you're spending um, if you're spending a substantial amount of time on the water, it, you know, buying a Challenger kit is uh, well worth the investment. And, in, uh, you know, why hire a guide and spend the money doing that and be miserable all day, right? Well, it's funny you say it because I just got back from that snowmobile and trip and I put that uh, Challenger insulated suit, and, you know, through, through the max. And all these guys are wearing their <coughs> FXR or whatever, all these fancy things. And they're like... I'm just as warm as you are, and I don't need a separate thing. Like you, you can invest in that. And I can use that for ice fishing. I could use it for the snowmobiling. I use it in the spring, and the fall. I mean, the reality is, it's 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 a three season kit. But the one thing that just kills me, I don't care what company you are, what you're using, what piece of clothing. But the two two things that just kill me in a boat. Guy's got a hundred thousand dollar Ranger boat. He's ripping up and down the lake, getting two miles a gallon. You know, filling that tank up. And he's got a shitty net and shitty rain gear. It's just, I don't yeah. know. I, and those are the two things I tell everybody. Those are the two things that you will almost use every single trip or need, hopefully, every single trip. Um, that's just the reality. It's just funny where we all choose to spend our, our money in funny places, I guess. Yeah, I like, you know, I work a lot of shows and, and uh, I have the benefit of not actually having to sell physically to people. I mean, obviously, a big part of my job is marketing and, and you know, uh, but I'm not actually. Uh, handling the transaction between the consumer and we call them whistlers. Um, you know, you get the people who come into the booth and they go, "How much is this suit?" And you go, "Oh man, this Pro Dry. You know, it's it's a thousand bucks." And they go, <whistles> and then they just uh, and they keep on walking, right? And and I totally get that, but I, um, you know, my my argument is always, okay, so you spent sixty to eighty thousand dollars on a Ranger. Um, you're staring down, looking at two, you know, electronic units that are a thousand bucks a pop, and you're soaking wet, and all you can think about is how you want to go back in. <clears throat> Why not make the investment and 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 you know be able to enjoy, um, especially up here where uh, our time is so kind of precious for the fishing season. That um, man, I the the idea of not wanting to go out uh, when the weather's inclement is. Um, is is not an option for me you know especially as a musky fisherman like i look at the forecast and go oh man it's about the thunderstorm better get out there you know <laughs> yeah musky you guys are a whole different breed the shittier the better right i mean it's, yeah <laughs> it's kind of crazy but we so, like to follow the we like to follow pressure trends and unfortunately those are generally uh you know followed with weather changes so. yeah as a walleye guy i pretty much want the opposite but uh, yeah exactly i guess that's why it's <laughs> such a such a different deal but so what's a, what's a daily thing as community leader you know i hear that that title more and more with different companies and i know sims has had that that tag for a while yeah what, what's I a mean, daily deal yeah so uh generally when someone asks me that and say i'm in a you know my elevator pitch is i uh the the most basic way for me to boil it down is I, I jokingly refer to them as I say uh, I get to build a real life fantasy fishing team um, the what I really do on it I mean my day to day can range from working with anglers and doing the very basic thing of like placing orders for guys all the way up to developing um, where we're going to spend our marketing dollars across the uh, the, the marketplace so um, I'm tied into um uh, Everything from our print buys to what we do with, uh, you know, on social, um, who we partner with it, it, as far as our angler spread, um, and then managing those relationships with those with those anglers. And then, uh, you know, I go to a few shows here and there. Um, you know, next month I'll be in like six states and two countries, uh, all for work. So, um, I actually pack up tomorrow and go to the Milwaukee Muskie Expo to work that show, get back on Sunday, fly to Bozeman on Monday for meetings, uh, home for three days, go to the Bassmaster Classic, uh, home for two days, fly to New Jersey for the New Jersey saltwater fishing show and so on and so on. So wait a minute, wait uh, a minute, wait a minute. You work in the fishing industry. I thought you fish all the time. That's what I Yeah, did. yeah, right. right. Yeah, no, I, the, the, um, I get to hear about fishing all the time, right? <laughs> like if you, 
I feel like I should probably start some sort of uh, blog or, or like daily update report because uh, on any given day I can tell you exactly what's happening in the Keys all the way to what the spotted bass are doing in California. Uh, you know, that's the that's the cool thing about my job is someone who's really into fishing and just likes to um, be kind of a sponge for, for fishing knowledge, you know. Like I am very privy to have conversations with People like yourself, I, you know, talk to the John Cox, Brandon Polnicks of the world, not name dropping. It's just, you know, sure, that's sure, just, sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just my job. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people get to read the, the articles that are written on how a tournament was won. And, and fortunately for me, I get to talk to the guys after the event and actually get, you know, the real story on a lot of stuff. And, and, and that's what's really cool about uh, about this position is uh you know, there's a lot, and, and when you get to choose who you want to work with, you you surround yourself with uh, a lot of like-minded people, and and our sim squad of uh, of anglers, I'd put up against anyone on any body of water, and um, uh, you know, we just have a really dialed team, and and they're all really really cool, and um, you know, I get photos of dudes catching muskies in Tennessee, and I get photos of dudes with permit in the Keys, and it's you know. But uh, I am not there doing it. <laughs> well, and, and that's kind of a good little send off there as far as, you know, like, again, what's important to you? Because I think of a guy like people ask me this all the time, like, especially now with all the kids and getting into fishing, you know, because of the college fishing and stuff like that. They, uh, it's just different than it was when I was in school, at least. And I look at a guy like Kevin Van Dam, and, and to me, whether you like him or you don't, he's kind of the ultimate blend between balance and business. Yep. Um, Ike Anelli, I think, is that way now, where he definitely wasn't before. You know, like his business game went up, and I think his fishing maybe suffered a little bit. But you have to realize, like, it's a business, and so you need those two things to be at a high level, and that's how you are, like, one of those guys. Like, Palinek, for sure, would be, in my mind, the the, the biggest of the newer guys, even though he's not yep. new. And, you know, th those things are obviously important because people don't realize that it's, you know, casting a line. There are some guys, you know, you could joke about like John Cox being maybe one of those guys that he just wins. So that's what he does now. Yeah. But, but overall, like what are the things that are important to, you know, Patterson slash Sims that you guys look at? Um, because again, minus a couple guys, just casting, casting lure isn't going to do it. That's not enough. Right. Or am yeah. I it's, it, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> You know, I don't know how much time you have. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, we want the good stuff. Don't hold back. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's there, there's a couple things. There's a couple things to take into consideration. I'd say, you know, there there are the guys like like someone like uh, and Brian Thrift is not on our team. You know, I'd love to have him on the squad, but uh, there, there are some anglers that are gonna um, make a living fishing. Um, solely based on winning tournaments right and 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 those anglers tend to be um have to not work quite as hard on the sponsorship side i wouldn't say that they that they um uh, but it it they don't have to fill that gap as much right like because they because they're such uh phenomenal anglers right but when you start to narrow down the window of time for a lot of these professional anglers to make money um, man, I mean, it's, it's like, it, it, you know, it, it's basically going to, uh, someone who works a nine to five job and saying, okay, you're only going to have to work 40 days a year, but you're only going to, going to get a chance to potentially make your full year salary on those like seven days basically. Right. And so, um, you know, there's, I would say that this new, this new wave of, of anglers, um, and, and I, and I don't want to like, um, you know, make big general assumptions, but they don't understand. I don't think how difficult it, it is to actually make a living in the fishing industry. Um, you either have to be really, really good, um, or or you have have to be really good and a really good business person, which are which are like what you were saying. Those those are two hard tasks, right? Like you get pulled in a lot of different directions. Um. And I don't see a lot of the young kids putting in the work um, at the industry level. They're so concerned about um, promoting themselves versus what they could potentially be doing um, to establish relationships in the fishing industry. So, you know, like I, so if it, you know, if we're talking like 
a younger kid. I mean, um, you know, I want to see him at shows. Um, I'm still at shows. I'm 36 years old. I've been a VP of marketing at the world's largest uh, tournament organization, and I still go stand in a booth at the Milwaukee Muskie Expo, right? Like, it's part of the business. Um, They're great networking opportunities, and there's tons of ways for young guys to make an impression on people like myself at those shows. Like, dude, help me carry a box out, and I'll probably give you a rain jacket. You know what I mean? Like, that's the type of relationship management that's just not there because I don't necessarily think they see the importance of that. Um, You know, having a big social following is is cool. Um, I work with guys who have, you know, 150,000 Instagram followers, and I work with guys that have uh, uh, no Instagram account, right? And it and it depends on, um, you know, what they're capable of doing with that. Um, you know, I look at certain people like a Luke Ronestrant, who, um, if you don't know him, then you're probably not plugged into the fishing industry. If you do know him, then you know he's like one of the greatest guys of all time. And, uh, you know, his, uh, his wife started a social media account for him called if Luke was on social media and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you I know, like his wife already. Yeah. Yeah. She's awesome. Um, but the, the fact is, is like Luke has, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, client list that is, uh, very robust that is, um, uh, that, that sort of transcends all throughout the the upper midwest he's very influential with his uh people in the boat he has uh interactions with uh clients um on a day-to-day basis and he um you know i think i i really like working with guides people who are really like at the end of the day the people who probably grind the hardest outside of tournament anglers are you guys who are on the water guiding every day and those interactions with clients and the experiences that they have with you where you are stuck in a rainstorm and you get back to the boat ramp and you're smiling and you're still comfortable and they're soaked and you go, oh, look, man, you know, you can buy the same rain suit and we could be chilling at the same level, you know. Um, yeah, there's nothing exclusive that, about what I'm wearing. It's just you can get it too. Yeah, I mean, and so like I, I, you know, I look for, I look for personalities that are not polarizing um you know, I, I, I don't, we don't really, we're, we're not, we're not a brand who's going and looking for like the most rambunctious person in the world. You know, uh, um, we like the anglers who are respected amongst their peers and, and fish in a way that is not uh, polarizing as well. Like I'm really diligent in making sure that like the guys on our bass team don't have any like weird sort of things floating around in the industry about them you know potentially like uh you know there's a lot of the fishing industry is unfortunately a giant rumor mill um and uh and and i try and pick anglers who i don't hear about in that rumor mill a lot right um and uh and and guys who understand that they they just need to that, that, that the industry is a grind and are willing to do um, what needs to needs to happen for the brands that are supporting them. You know, I see these guys and they send me a friend request, John Smith. Hey, don't know John. And the next day he's got 4,900 friends and then he's changing his page to John Smith Fishing. And it's like no disrespect anybody because I want to go fishing too. It's what I do. But like, and there's no disrespect to whatever you do, whether you work in a car plant, you're an accountant or whatever it is. But Everybody is kind of like, it's like the kid thing a little bit. Like they're trying to be something, but yet just not enjoy fishing and going and doing fishing. And they're, they're hitting Patterson up with no ability and, and desires. You know what I mean? It's like on Tuesday, if you can't do a photo shoot with Sims because you have work and you have no vacation time, that's why you don't have pro at the end. I know I'm going to get shit for that, but yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I, there's, there's like, and there's guys that I sponsor for sure that, that do have that nine to five job. Um, you know, they might be like an HVAC installer or like electrician, you know, or something like that. And then, and, but they're committed to fishing enough tournaments throughout a year where I'm like, this guy's committed. He's just trying to make ends, ends meet. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and especially up here, it's tough. You know, there's, there's not a lot of bodies of water where you can guide 
uh, you know, the whole season. So it's, it's tough. Like there's definitely an off season up here for a lot of these dudes, but, um, no, I think, you know, a lot of those, a lot of the young kids, like they'll, they'll hire a guide and they'll be like, Hey, can I shoot a video? And then, you know, they try and basically piggyback on that person's ex- expertise and, and say like, you know, here I am catching these giant smallmouth. And it's like, well, you, you hired a guide. I've had a few of the internet <laughs> kids do that to me. Yeah. I'm yeah. Leave that right there. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. And then what, a trend that seems to be happening is like, especially on the East coast, I'm hearing a lot about it, um, up here, but like, you know, people will hire, hire the guides, um, on some pretty like specific bodies of water. And then next thing you know, they're starting a guide business after they've, they've been showed the ropes. And, and I just, I, I just, that just rubs me the wrong way. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not like a traditional industry where, you know, that there's, I don't know, you got to kind of cut your teeth in this industry and gain some respect before the industry is going to respect you back, you know. Pops and grandpa would call that putting cart in front of the horse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, and, and I do think just, I, I think, um, like I said, I'm, I, I really do feel like high school and college fishing are, are unbelievable avenues for getting more anglers in there. And I'll say that, uh, you know, the um a lot of the youtube kids like the guggen squad crew like that i will you know people some people hate them some people love them but i will say that they probably saved a generation of of kids fishing um that that would not have been um that would not have been engaged in in going out and trying it i mean i've i've guided a couple um uh friends kids you know who are like hey man like blah, blah, blah. I want to go out and fish and they show up and they got a John B t-shirt on. And I'm like, okay, like this dude's, I, I, I immediately know where this guy's getting, you know, what he's watching. And that, that kid got in my boat and I was like, here, you know, this is what we're going to throw on the river. And he's like, is this a whopper plopper? And I'm like, holy crap. Like you're 13, you know what a whopper plopper is, you know, like, uh, and in our day that was jimmy houston and a banjo minnow you know like i mean and and so like i think people just consume media in a different way so i'm, I'm not i'm not bad mouthing you know there, there's pluses and minuses um you know to both sides but i feel like that high school and college thing may be transitioning more people into thinking that there's a full-time uh uh job opportunity out there in, in the industry and and i think You know, when you start to look at like, okay, now we have three bass tours plus a national walleye tour and, um, you know, all the little sub tournaments, et cetera. Like, I can't imagine what, you know, decisions are having to be made at a company like Johnson Outdoors or whatever, even from like a tournament support standpoint. Like, how are you going to get a support trailer to all of those events and take care of it? a lot of of money right there. Yeah, a lot of money. And, And so I think that we're at this like, boiling point in the industry of probably um at least from a at least from a tournament standpoint where like there's probably going to be a little bit of a reckoning in that like i I don't know how many anglers are are are, are out there that you know are willing to throw down 60 70k on a season without much sponsorship support and and there's just so many anglers like i mean i would love to take care of, of I mean, I have a, that's, that's the one negative of, of, of my position in this, in this industry is that, um, I have a lot of friends, uh, that I've made over the years and being able to separate friendships from business and being able to tell friends, no, that I can't help you out with a budget because it doesn't align with our marketing initiatives. Like, you know, I'm telling elite series anglers that I really, really like and have really dialed in relationships with and talk to all the time no and then you know here's a group of you know 15 20 year olds asking me for stuff and they and and not understanding that like you know there's people that, that i have to turn down that i've known for for 10 years so um, and that that's the hard part of it. but the fun part is i know the stories you must have and I'm, i want to try to pull a few of those out because you know i'm i'm pretty loose to the lips when it is to come and talk in this stuff but We've done those on previous ones, and we'll do a few more. I'll give you one good one before we're gone. But, I mean, you've got to tell me another one of yours that just made you go to your wife at night and want to kick the dog, drink angel tears or something, and just, <laughs> you know, kick baby seals or something. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I would say that, that uh, 
the the stories that I have tend to be more uh, of like peeks into anglers day to day and like personal lives. And, um, you know, I try, I, I get a lot of that information from those dudes. And I think part of that is that I haven't, uh, I, I try my best not to divulge, um, you know, too many of those secrets. Um, I, I, the, you know, I, it, it's amazing to me. Um, I would say that I'm, I'm not necessarily, um, at the epicenter of the rumor mill, but I get, man, I get a lot of the peripheral, uh, we don't need any specifics, but I mean, a guy of your travels, trials and tribulations with people, I mean, we don't need anything to even give it away. I mean, but there's just those stories you were like, I mean, I'll give you one real fast that I just think is funny that somebody in your situation would appreciate. So I get called by a sponsor to do an open house or, uh, excuse me, a store opening, a new store opening. So I'm there and I'm hanging around. This dude comes up to me. He's like, man, I know who you are, bro. I know who you are, bro. I'm like, oh, okay, man. And they go back to walleye fish. And, and this dude had a, I won't say what the company, but he had a shirt and a hat on. I mean, he looked like, you know, like a sales support staff. I mean, for all I know, five seconds before he could have been, you know, because as you know, with these store openings, they've got a rep from almost every line that they yeah, have yeah. or a regional guy or a pro staff guy or whatever. And this guy just kept going on and on and on. And, and again, the guy probably never suspected it because of what we talked about earlier with, you know, competition where maybe it's a guy from, you know, um, AFCO or, or Gill or something there. And, and they know I work with Sims. And so they'd be like, well, certainly he wouldn't be talking to the like, AFCO rep, not knowing that before he was AFCO rep, he worked at wherever. And I've known him for 20 years. And it was one of those deals. And the guy just kept pushing and pushing. And he was telling me how great he was and everything efficient. And I was kind of like, that's cool, man. Hey, good for you. You know, you know, I took 19th place in my Tuesday night club there last week and he's going on and I'm just trying not to be an asshole to be perfectly honest with you but I'm kind of like okay dude and then he's like hey you see you see this you see this you see that and I'm like okay and he's like I'm sponsored by that company and it just kept going and going and going and I look at the guy next to me and uh, the guy's like so what are you looking at him him man and I'm like ah nothing so finally the guy standing next to me longtime friend pulls out hands a card to the guy and he said i'd appreciate it if you don't buy any more of our product if this is again how you're going to handle yourself <laughs> it was the brand manager for that company yeah yeah and after he got done telling everybody he, and he was one of those like looking around as, he, as he's like yo i'm with this company you know and it was just like <laughs> yeah. and again those things now don't bother me like they used to you know because maybe i'm much more mature or whatever but it's just funny that you hear these things and you're like dude come on really you got a bird, bird on the loose over there. Yeah, we got we got birds. It's I, I have a staff of birds, but oh, nice. <laughs> at least no, it's not I, a seagull. I uh, no, I run into that all the time. I mean, I have people, uh, I have people um, pop in uh, to the booth at trade shows and like, yeah, I'm a Sims pro and blah blah blah, and they kind of like go down this whole this whole trail, and I'll be like, yeah, so like, you know who do you work with or whatever? And, and, you know, they have no idea that they're actually talking to the person that handles all the, all the pro staff, uh, all the pro staff deals. But no, I mean, I, I like, you know, I have guys who, um, who come up to me all the time and, and tell me, you know, who they are and, and what they, you know, they fish FLW and like do all this stuff. And, and I'm standing there thinking, yeah, I know I used to run, uh, you know, marketing for that company. I know exactly who you are. I've taken photos of you on the water and like, you can't even put the two together that you're talking to the same person, you know, like a lot of egos in the fishing industry for no. sure. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the ego, the ego thing is definitely, um, it gets, it, it honestly, most anglers are their own worst enemy. Um, and, and if they just, you know, uh, and, and that goes back to like who I like to pick on, on pro staffs is like, you don't know how many times I've stood in a booth with someone that has, you know, well, especially at Sims, like we have a lot of really accomplished anglers, right? So like John Frazier, who handles our PR and, uh, and uh, social and stuff. Awesome dude. One of my favorite people in the entire world. That dude has fished more saltwater water. And like with a fly rod that and been to, he used to work for a saltwater sportsman uh, or a couple different couple different magazines. I would say magazine. Kevin Bacon nine degrees separation. One of his good friends is a pretty good friend of mine. Sermelli. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so, anyways, Fraser Fraser's an OG dude and and been all over the world and and we'll be at shows and people start 
you know, people come in, they start rifling on like how badass they are uh, uh, in saltwater fishing and like this epic trip, this, you know, crazy trip they went on, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, you're like, you don't re- like people assume. I think one of the things that people assume a lot is like that they're the best angler, um, you know, uh, sorry, uh, uh Brandon Polnick's actually calling me right now. <laughs> um, we, we don't have any time for bass holes right now. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think people don't really uh, understand that there's a, you know, no matter what show you're at or um, what you're, you're talking about, there's probably someone in the room that is more experienced or has done exactly what you're talking about Um you know, 10 times more than you have, you know, that's, I, I always, I always try and keep my fishing, um, kind of talks of like what I, I like to talk to people about my experiences, but I don't like to, uh, I try and keep my knowledge share that comes across as like being an expert to, to a basic, you know, bare minimum, um, but yeah, no, man, there's there's some crazy stories, dude. I get phone calls from people who are like, man, I was on the side of the highway with this legend, and we were smoking a blunt, and we blew out a tire, and the trailer is pulled over on the side of the road. Next thing you know, the state trooper comes up, and this old-time fishing dude's still ripping the blunt when the state trooper shows up, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he like buries it in the rocks while the state trooper is asking us if we need any help, and then when the state trooper leaves, he uncovers the rocks and keeps smoking the blunt, you know, and you're like what the hell are you talking like what world are you living in you know and then there's guys who like oh man yeah i won that tournament but my boat was catching on fire i forgot to put the drain plug in so the thing was flooding all day and then i'm you know bilge from running you're like you won a tournament and your boat caught fire like i don't like what you know um and then there's just there's just like uh oh you know i get i get lots of the like party stories and the and uh um you know i would say that to a certain extent, I'm a little bit of a therapist and a life coach to some of these guys because they, uh, you know, it's tough to it's tough to talk to people in this industry and have legitimate, like, real uh, conversations, you know, because a lot of times there's al- al- ulterior motives on both sides. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think in the fishing industry, a lot of the deals are done after hours, you know what I mean? They really oh, yeah. Because of that relationship thing. And, and again, yeah, everybody, no, no, I, everybody's kind of, I mean, there's a lot of phoniness, like you said, and, and I totally get with what you're saying. I mean, it's just, I look at myself and I'm like, you know, 10 years ago, I thought I was pretty good. You know, I was doing well with stuff. And now I look at like 10 years ago compared to where I am now with my fishing abilities and how things have progressed with technology and grasping these things. And you feel like you were standing still back then. You yeah. Know? I mean, same thing with when you look at a guy like Brandon Palinark or KVD or you, you're just like, man, that you thought you were good 10 years ago. Well, what are you now then? Yeah, those those guys those guys are there are a handful of dude the, the the really really successful guys in the fishing industry are the perfect mix of really talented angler and uh, compelling personality and really good business person and to find those three is really tough um, and so. I think when you're thinking about being a professional angler, you have to take all three of those things into consideration. I mean, um, you know, you, like you don't have to win, but it makes life a lot easier, especially if you're a likable guy and, uh, you know, you show up and do your job out on and off the water. I think Gerald Swindle would, uh, I think he kind of fits in that, that deal there, doesn't he? Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, there's, you know, I think Swindle is, is one of those, um, I, I don't really know, know Gerald, um, on a personal level. Um, I've had some interactions with him and, um, he's very genuine, uh, you know, and it's not a shtick, you know, that's just his personality and he's, and he's figured out how to kind of capitalize on that. Um, and let's be honest, Lulu really helps his, helps him out. Like she, I've done enough media stuff with him that like she ropes him in like, all right, here's the deal. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, that's, that's what other people don't realize is that really behind, behind a lot, especially at the tour level for the elite series and FLW, 
most of the really successful anglers, not not all of them, but most of them have an unbelievable female support staff behind them that are uh, basically keeping their ass in line and, and, and making sure that they, you know, are at the ramp and fed and they do those. Let me tell you something. If you got a woman who can back a, uh, a dually with a camper in the back of it at a, at a 150 boat launch, uh, at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning and, and put her right between the, put her right between the lines. Like, you know, that's a dime a dozen right there. No, 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 that, that, that's probably ring material. That's probably yeah. ring material. That's <laughs> most of, and most of like, yeah, I would say, uh, I would say if you can, if you can back a boat and trailer, you can go get yourself a pretty good angler. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, leave me with one really good story. I mean, FLW time. I mean, I know the stuff that you're around. I mean, just, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I, I even have a couple in the back of my mind, but I mean, I want you just to give us one unsolicited that you almost feel like someone's going to yell at you for telling us, but we're not going to give any names. They're just going to leave me like, wow. Most of them are so inappropriate. <laughs> That's exactly what we want. We can bleep things out, you know. We can even uh, cut. We'll give you final approval. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, this is this is not. We we'll give you final approval on these and let you cut hey, or can, something. Can I, can I answer this call real quick? Is that okay? I mean, is it Palinik again? Is that who it is? Yeah, it's like the third time. I can't wait. Yeah, absolutely, and I cannot wait to when I see him to yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm I'm filming a uh, I'm filming a podcast with uh, Ross Robertson. That's why I keep. Hey, the- tell him he thinks he catches big walleyes. You know, I know you catch big walleyes. <laughs> you think out there, but mm. what do you say? <laughs> Thanks, dude. All right. All right. So that sorry, leads me to sorry. two things. That leads me to two. <laughs> sorry, things. I'm really sorry. Bass guys always get more respect than the walleye guy, but we punch hard. Not true. We. It, we punch harder, hundred percent. Bass guys rolling around the parking lot. One number, number one, number two. That's a prime example of people don't realize that it's not all about just casting a line. Like here's Brandon Palinuk, an accomplished guy. Here's me doing a podcast. I mean, I, I know I have been called the Howard Stern of fishing. I'm not sure if that's good <laughs> or bad, but the reality that's is, is that these are so many the different things that go into that. You know what I mean? It's people don't realize this yeah. is a constant deal. Constantly. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I like uh, so you know that's like we we have a we asked Brandon to help us out with a video uh, for our challenger suit, um, and you know he just placed in the top ten uh, or twenty. I think he got a, I think he was top ten at that elite series event. Um, he was going to drive to Dayton, Tennessee, to fix fish chick they canceled that event due to high water he uh we're on a tight timeline to get the assets so he's literally on his way uh to the next uh, i'm assuming Bur- birmingham for the for the classic to like drop his rig it's raining so he's stopping to film this video in a rain suit and that's why he called me three times you know because he's about to hop out and go do it and just wanted some some final direction and i mean yeah that's that's Dude, that is the game. You gotta hustle, um, you know, and and um, people just don't just don't realize that. Um, but yeah, no, man. I mean, um, I I get asked all the time, like, so what do you do in the off season? I'm like, the off what? Yeah, dude, I'm I'm busier this time of the year than than I am uh, than I am during the. You know, I don't obviously I'm not a full time guide, but. Once you guys hit the water and, and, and are doing your deal, I, I sort of start to get left alone. And, and, and that's when I actually get to sneak out and, and go hit the water for sure. Um, but uh, no, it's um, – yeah, I, I, uh, I'm still – so one story I think would that would be appropriate is um, – Yeah, I mean after – I mean is it a bass guy hopefully after being interrupted by a bass guy? Yeah, no, I was going to say, like, um, was, uh, I think, I can't remember if, if Forrest was telling me the story or Nina was telling me the story, but it was, uh, it was about how, um, like, I, this would probably be like five or 10 years ago. Um, they had like a possum problem at the house down there and, uh, in flipping and, uh, 
Keith Daffron was standing there uh, with with Forrest and Nina, and uh, I, it's my understanding, I think, that Forrest went down there to see what the racket was in his underwear at however 80 plus years old, uh, and uh, Nina came down, and I, I may be butchering it, but she came out and actually uh, took care of the possums with a 22 or something, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, that's a big loss for the industry for sure. He was a uh, I had the privilege of uh, I had the privilege of sitting at a couple dinners with him um, and and spending some time with Forrest and and he was a he was an unbelievable uh, person and a huge figure in the fishing industry and I think if uh, there were more people who modeled uh, how and uh, what to do in the fishing industry after after him the 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 industry would be a better place for sure. I, he is just one of the most incredible guys I've ever met. I, everybody has a Forest Wood story, and none of them are bad, and they're all no. entertaining. And he certainly wasn't trying to be entertaining, but he his sayings were just legendary. You know, I mean, yeah. just, I, I just, I've spent enough time with him, fortunately, at boat shows or down at Flippin', and uh, I don't know anybody that has a bad word to say about him, to be honest. We, we, we were at a dinner one night, and uh, um, it was – at, at F, it was at after a tournament or something. I forget where it was, and I was sitting next to him, and it was me, Forrest, and a couple other people. And then there was a big uh, Japanese contingency that was at the table, and um, we're sitting there, and they had a translator and everything. And um, uh, Forrest turns to me at one point in the dinner, and he goes, uh, "Do you understand anything that's being said?" And, <laughs> and I go. Uh, nope, but my understanding is they want to hear about your cattle operation. <laughs> Some Kobayashi. So, so Forrest went down this whole thing. They, they were like so interested to know about, uh, not about, you know, the fishing industry or anything like that. They wanted to know about his beef operation. So Forrest talked for like an hour about how many head of cattle and how many acres he was running and everything. And, uh, the translator translated everything back to this, to this group. And, um, you know, That's I, awesome. I've. Yeah, that was uh, that was cool. No, I've had a lot of cool experience, a lot of late nights with a lot of uh, a lot of really good people in this industry, and and um, you know it's a uh, it's a fun place to it's a fun place to make a living for sure, and uh, it's kind of hard on your liver sometimes, but uh, uh, I think I'll, you know I'd rather be doing it out of fun than than depression, you know. <laughs> yeah, the, the fishing industry for sure is a family. Just look at how many people that we mutually know and um, and and growing all the time. Yep, for sure, for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on. We'll probably do this again, and um, then maybe next time we can talk about some of those new Sims products that are coming out that we can't talk about right now, but I know I'm looking forward to using them and seeing it. And uh, other than that, I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Big Water Podcast. We will be here again like clockwork next week, and we will have all kinds of fancy new stuff. We won't tell you who is on the show quite yet, but long story short, Big Water Fishing, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or the web, that's where we're at. Thanks, guys.